So Hatfield, let's open up a Bible together. The book of Acts, chapter 19. So we are officially in our very last sermon in this third series in the book of Acts. We started with Real Christianity, our first series, and then we spoke about those Jesus people about a year ago. And now we've got our third series. After this, we'll finish up the book of Acts. But this one we've called Tales of the Table. And the reason is we've been saying that the most powerful symbol of flourishing in the early church was never the temple. It was the table. It is around these thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably eventually meals in the early church in the ancient Mediterranean. There, it was in that setting that people got to know what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be filled with the Spirit and to be city changers, to take up their calling and to impact their environment with the good news of Jesus. And so we've been saying, man, if, if, just imagine if you could hear the stories, the tales of all those tables. What would they tell us? That's what we have in the book of Acts. And now we're saying, but guess what? We have the same Holy Spirit within us. We have the same love of the Father surrounding us. We have the same good news gospel of Jesus in our hearts. And so if we were to take that seriously, imagine what the tables of our offices and communes and homes, what would they begin to tell as we take up this calling? So we're finishing up today. And last week we spoke about the missional professionals. We asked the question, what is your profession, Dr. O. Hatfield? And, and some people told me, man, they were pumped up last week about being a programmer or plumber or pediatrician for Jesus. But I think it left us with the why question, how will I do this? And it's so beautiful how this final passage in our series transitions to this so powerfully. So Acts 19 verse 1. I'm just going to speak to the part where it says, Paul, he traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples, so followers of Jesus, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So into what then were you baptized? He asked them. Into John's baptism. We read about that at the beginning of the Gospels. John, the baptizer, making the way straight, preparing the Jewish people specifically for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. Well, Paul said, well, John, he baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized, submerged in water in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. So that's probably the shortest scripture we've had in this whole series. And it's probably the simplest. And the action item for the end of our service is clear from the very beginning. And yet, it has got the simplest application and yet the most profound implications for how we live our Christian lives. And the reason is, this passage so beautifully, what you see all throughout the book of Acts in the New Testament, takes it together, almost a bit of theology for us today, but that implicates so heavily on how we live our lives, it so clearly says three things. And I want to illustrate it literally just walking across the stage. A Christian, according to this passage, a Jesus follower, three things so crucial in the life of that person. Number one, it says that for you to become a Christian has nothing to do with your family, where you were born, your background, your language, your culture. None of that has any bearing. Only one thing. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus for your life? Do you trust in His life, death, and resurrection? Do you believe in who He says He is? And this passage says that Paul finds Jesus' followers, Christians, not cultural Christianity, I'm following Jesus. There has to be a time in my life. I cannot be born into the Christian faith. I have to come to a place where I say I trust in Jesus alone. I lay down my life, I repent of my sins, I take up his new life, and the Holy Spirit in that moment, this passage says, is then fully given to me. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in my life. That's the first thing that needs to happen. I become a Christian, and the Holy Spirit fully takes up residence in me. You have the presence of God through his Holy Spirit if you're a Christian. But then Paul asked them this question, have you been baptized? And the word baptism simply means to be fully submerged into something. It was a symbol that Jesus gave to the early church to say as a, as a profound object lesson almost. You can get confused in your mind and your heart. You, your life can throw you around. But, but if you get plunged into water somewhere in your life, as an act to say, I have died to my old self and I've been raised to the new life of Jesus, man, that sticks in your soul. 
and billions of people in the last 2,000 years in every country and island and culture imaginable have said because of what Jesus has done, not what I've done, because of what Jesus has done, my belief in that, I will have myself publicly baptized as an outward sign of an inward reality. I publicly confess that I associate with Jesus. But then he goes even further. You know, they say, okay, but we got baptized into John's baptism. He realizes that was a different thing. John was doing a different thing, needed thing, important thing. But Jesus said, be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. But then he goes even further and he says, you Christians who have been baptized now, he asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they're like, what is the Holy Spirit even? We haven't even heard that there is something like that. Doesn't that just make you so at ease if you think you come here this morning, Christianity is about having it all together. These guys were full-blown Christians. They had not even heard about the Holy Spirit yet. Friends, we are not in the microwave culture of faith. It's a long-distance race. It's slow-cooking faith. It takes years and decades of following and falling and being reignited by the grace of Jesus. So these guys say, man, yes, we are Christians. They get baptized in water, but they have not even heard of the Spirit yet. And Paul says, you know what needs to happen to you who have the Spirit's presence in you? You need to be baptized in the Spirit. You need to have a moment where you are empowered by the Spirit of God for mission. And he says, they lay hands on them. And the Holy Spirit just comes upon these people. He descends upon them. And some of them start even speaking in tongues and just prophesying. It's like the Spirit of God just flows out of them. What a beautiful picture. So very practically, part of the question for today is, if I come to the place where I trust in nothing but Jesus, have I come as a Christian then to the place where I have been baptized as a public sign of my faith? But subsequent to that, have I, as someone who have the presence of God within me, have I had a moment in my life where I said, Holy Spirit, will you baptize me in power for the effectiveness of what we're doing here? Because Paul asks just two things to note here in this passage I think you can highlight this because it's really important. Two things. He asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Why would he ask that? It's obviously not because he did not think that they were Christians. He acknowledges that. He's like, yes, I can see. I acknowledge the fact that you are a Jesus follower. So he's not mixing up the fact that as a Christian, you receive the presence of the Spirit. If you receive Christ and the very next second of your life, you die you have fully received the Holy Spirit's presence. There's nothing you can do to earn that. It's the gift of God. He takes up residence in you. But Paul asked the question because his assumption is there is a second moment for Christians where they receive something of an empowerment in the Spirit. Together with the Spirit comes the gifts of the Spirit. And we don't run after the gifts. Man, we run after the Spirit. God is Spirit. And he says, there's a moment where I need to experience. So that's the second thing. He says, you would know if you had been baptized with the Spirit. If it was something that happens in your sleep somewhere, and you even know it, then how can he ask them that question? He's like, yes, you, you tell me if you follow Jesus, but have you been baptized in the Spirit? They're like, I don't know. Implication, you will know. You will know if you've been baptized in the Spirit. But he also says it's not something that you can make happen. They just faithfully lay their hands on them and they pray, Jesus, will you baptize them with your spirit? But you will know. And here's the last thing that's so beautiful. Please note this, that this, this is what I want for myself. Michael and I spoke about this in the week, just saying, man, I never want to look back on my life. And any of us look back and say, those early days of my faith, when I used to be so passionate about Jesus, those are long gone. I want to, like some of my faith heroes in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, still be running even harder after Jesus than in their 20s and 30s. And what I see is the attitude that leads to that. In this group, when Paul says, has this happened to you? And they say, man, I'm going to be honest. I don't even know what this Holy Spirit thing is. What is the very next thing that they say? What's the posture they take? But I'm open and I'm eager to receive. I'm open and I'm eager to learn. 
I've not grown past the basics of the faith. I'm always digging deeper into the basics of the faith. So if you say, man, God has more for me, I'm humble enough to say I'm open to that. Whatever he has for me, I'm open. If it embarrasses me in front of people, who cares? If it makes me look foolish, who cares? If I'm 75 and I'm still wrestling through the basics, who cares? I want what he has. And they say, Paul says, are you open to this? And what I see in them is the posture to say yes. And they receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Maybe to help with this distinction, because there is some argy-bargy in the church about this. Some people don't agree with this doctrine. And they would say, no, we, we all have the Spirit. There's no need for any of this other stuff. It's all done and dusted when you become a Christian. I like this idea. Michael Eaton, he's a theologian. And he says the difference between becoming a Christian and fully having the presence of the Spirit in you and a subsequent moment, there can be days later, months later, years later even, where you are baptized in the Spirit for power and effectiveness. He says it's like the difference between an airplane that you are in. And he says when you cross in an airplane the boundary of one country to the next, you don't really notice that in the plane, do you? It's not like a bump that you're like, whoops, there we just went over. But yet, if you land, you realize we definitely went from one country to the next. There's no doubt about that. But you don't notice it like that. But he says the difference. So, so becoming a Christian is not something you're like, and there, I've just been saved. Wow, that was powerful. It's like I just experienced being taken out of the kingdom of darkness and place. I just got adopted, renewed, restored, raised a new life. I felt the jolt. It doesn't happen necessarily like that. Some people genuinely say, I've been Christian since I can remember. Some people say, I had a powerful moment, just broken in tears, giving myself up to God. But you don't necessarily feel that, and yet it's as concrete as going from one country to the next. But Michael Eaton says, but to be baptized in the Spirit is like when the plane lands. You will know. You will know. Sometimes, depending on the pilot, you will really know once you've landed. Where's Michaela Maisenkel this morning? Pilot jokes. That's the difference. This one is as concrete, but you don't necessarily take note of it. This one is also as concrete, but you will know. That's why Paul says, has this happened to you? Last week we said this, that we are missional professionals. You are a painter, plumber, pediatrician, programmer, but you're a Christian first. And we're saying, man, that the church Monday to Saturday, that is where the Priscilla and Aquilas, we said last week, that was the change in the church, not primarily the Pauls. And the question should be, how can we do that? I feel so ill-equipped. Joe, you pumped me up last week, and I stepped into Monday immediately feeling ill-equipped. Welcome to Christianity. And how then does that happen? Can I tell you this? You cannot be a programmer, pediatrician, or plumber without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be a neighbor, colleague, friend, or family member for Jesus without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. Paul's not like, hey, you guys Christian, nice, let's move on. He's like, no, have you been baptized? Have you had this tangible moment of identifying with Jesus? Have you received the baptism empowerment of the Spirit? So you cannot, even the kids are excited about that. You cannot be the city changer God has called you to be without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.5 says that Christians are people who live according to the Spirit. That's who we are. That's why Jesus says, John 14, 6, man, I will ask the Father as I return. The earthly Jesus incarnate returns to the Father at the end of his ministry. And he says, I will give you another counselor to be with you forever. You will not do this alone. I take up residence with my presence within you, and I will empower you for what I call you to do. Whether parenting, whether business owning, <laughs> With the sharing the gospel, living out the character of God, you cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. So illustration, 10th of May last year, 2022. Anyone's birthday, by the way, 10th of May? Taking a chance. Passenger, Darren Harrison. This man is a business owner who goes to play some golf in the Bahamas, and he's in a little plane with a couple of other 
you know, guests of his on this trip, and suddenly the worst thing possible can happen. The pilot, in a couple of seconds, tells him, listen, I'm not feeling that well. And then he just slumps in his seat. And in the couple of seconds, I'm sure after praying a very short prayer to Jesus, this Daryl just jumps over two seats, he pushes the pilot out of the way, and having zero experience, of course, flying a plane, he grabs hold of the controls. And he scrambles to get like the headgear on, and he's trying his best to communicate to whoever and ask them, listen, we're in trouble, friends. And by miracle, of course, the ground control of the nearest airport is able to communicate to them. And what ends up happening, I love this, in the, in the records of this communication, he says to them, I'm sure not in a calm voice, he says, I've got a serious situation here. My pilot is incoherent, and here's the key, I have no idea how to fly an airplane. That is the war cry of the Christian. Monday morning, I have no idea how to do this. No idea. Parenting, no idea. Being a Christian business owner, no idea. Being a Christian student, no idea. Christian neighbor, we had a situation like that recently, laughing at ourselves. No idea how to be Christian neighbors. And I'm sure my neighbor will agree. <laughs> no idea. And so what happens? Robert, they call him Bobby, Robert Morgan. He's a flight instructor. He's called in from his lunch break. And I'm sure it's one of those like, do you want to finish your sandwich? Like now, you come now. And they say, you need to what? Guide. Come alongside him and you guide him. He has no idea what he's doing, but you will come alongside him and guide him. And what he says to them in this log, he says, you look great. You, you're a little faster. What I want you to do is grab the throttle, pull it back a little because we need you to go a bit slower. And just like that, one sentence at a time, he coaches this man who's never in his life flown a plane. All hands on deck for this one man. And he lands safely. How incredible is that? I love how Morgan praised Harrison. He said he was my best student ever. <laughs> Man, do you get a more powerful picture of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to those who say, I have no idea how to do this? And Jesus says, I will not leave you alone. I will send the one who comes alongside you. And who says, you're looking, you're looking good, but, but let me just help you here for a moment. You need to pull back a bit. You need to press in a bit. You need to cool it a bit. You, you need to listen to my spirit. You need to receive my power. You will be my best student ever. This is the call of every Christian. Not, and friends, this is so key. Hear, hear me today. If you're a Christian here today, this is not for the elite of the Christian faith. The green berets of the Christian faith, they are the people who love the Holy Spirit and His work. This is Christianity 101. Paul didn't say, you guys, I can see you are fresh out of the Christian oven. This Holy Spirit stuff's not for you yet. I'm sorry. At least five years of going to university, at least 10 years of struggling through a whole bunch of things, then come back to me and I'll tell you the real, like, hectic stuff of the Christian faith. No, he's like, you guys are just, I mean, you're just Christians. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. You have His presence fully within you. I recognize a brother and a sister in the faith. But what you need is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit if you're going to be a city changer, if you're going to be a missional professional. Can I make one or two quick points about the Holy Spirit? And then we're just going to pray the, probably the most ancient prayer in the church. Come, Holy Spirit. You do what only you can do. So prepare your heart. That's where we're going. That's where we're going to land. And I've got like no time, so I'm going to skip a whole bunch of things. So who is the Holy Spirit? Who's the Holy Spirit? I think a lot of the confusion comes from the fact, you know, we say, this is what we believe, that God, we don't believe in three gods, we believe in one God, monotheism, one God in three persons. That is very easy to believe, impossible to understand. <laughs> so not three gods, one in essence and three in person, and the third person of the Godhead is called the Holy Spirit. But I think we see the Holy Spirit as the force, the it, the thing, the, you know, the added extra. It's like when they ask you your cell phone contract, man, I just got a cell phone contract now recently. They ask them, obviously, all these extras. What extras do you want? The Holy Spirit we often see as the extra. 
Father, wow, love, you know, he adopts us. Jesus, man, goes to the cross for us. He redeems us. Holy Spirit, yeah, that's nice. That's like an extra. I think the confusion comes from the fact that we, we think, as the, the New Testament speaks of the pneuma, as the Spirit, it's breath, it's wind. Often the work of the Spirit is very abstract. He's, he's like a dove who descends upon Jesus. He's like wind and fire. So we have this it kind of mindset to the Spirit, but yet that's not what the Bible says. The Spirit is a person. There is a conscience behind all of creation. Before there was anything, there was a someone that we cannot fully comprehend. The Holy Spirit is not an it. Personal pronouns, John 14, 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you. He, not it. He will teach you. And why is he called the Holy Spirit? That sounds so Bible-y, right? Like so Christianese, the Holy Spirit. But some people have those black Bibles. If anyone still has a paper Bible, those black Bibles with the, the gold print, the Holy Bible. Why is it the Holy Spirit? And we, we probably think, well, it's because he is holy. The word holy means set apart, different. And it's like, well, because he is holy. Well, Jesus is holy. The Father is holy, so why is it the Holy Father, the Holy Jesus? And that's because the role of the Holy Spirit is primarily to make us holy. That's why He is the Holy Spirit. His calling is to take us from where we are every day, week, month, year, and decade and make us like Jesus. He is the Holy Spirit. Listen to all these verbs when it speaks about the Spirit. It says, another helper, he will teach you. He will bring in remembrance to you what Jesus said. He will bear witness about him in your heart. He will convict the world. He will guide. He will glorify Jesus. These are not things that an it can do. This is the heart of a person who loves you, who is with you, and is saying, I'm going to guide you all the way to the end. Because that's your calling. You cannot live this life. You cannot live this life as a Christian without the Spirit. But question I think many people then ask is why as a Christian would I need the Holy Spirit to empower me? Why would I need His power in my life? And I want to say as I've also grown, I've realized that question, though a good question, an innocent question, is like saying to an Olympic lifter, why would I need power? It's like a, a driver, the F1 driver saying, why would I need an engine to begin with? It's like, you know, if you're an actuarial scientist saying, why would I need cognitive abilities? That's the same deal. It's like, I'm a Christian. Why would I need the power of the Holy Spirit? And that's so powerful. Acts 1 verse 8, when Jesus says to his disciples, they are already following Jesus. He says to them, do not go until you have been empowered by the Holy Spirit, the gift that I will send. And that word power, dunamis, doesn't mean dynamite. Uh, that's making language go the other way around. But what it does mean is strength, might, power, ability. The Spirit is the dunamis of God, the ability of God. He is the strength to the Olympic lifter. He's the engine to the F1 driver. He's the cognitive ability to the actuarial scientist. Why do I need the Spirit? Because without Him, I can do nothing. What does the Holy Spirit give us? Yes, He gives us physical life. Psalm 104.30, it says, when you send forth, God, your spirit, they are created. God creates through his spirit. It's the spirit of God hovering over the chaos of the waters in Genesis. Job 34, it says, um, if he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. If God were to remove his spirit from all of creation, there would be no creation. So yes, he gives life. He gives spiritual life, Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing and regeneration of the Spirit of God. No one becomes a Christian because they decide to become a Christian. Everyone becomes a Christian because of the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. Paul doesn't say you've got, you, you had a bad season of life and then you started going to church. He says you were dead in your trespasses but you were made alive by the Holy Spirit. So yes, He gives natural life, He gives spiritual life, but here's the key. He gives power. He gives dunamis for service. I can say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you, but to follow you, I need the Spirit. And guess what? We cannot just profess Christian faith. I need to live Christian faith. Anyone can say I'm a Christian, 
But to follow Jesus, I need His Spirit. So He gives power. Even in the Old Testament, Joshua had wisdom and leadership skill. Deuteronomy 34, 9 says about him, Joshua, the son of Nun, he was full of the Spirit. For Moses had laid hands on him. It's the only way he could do what he did. And then, of course, the best example is Jesus. Everything about Jesus. In his human nature, he says, I am leaning on the Spirit of my Father. Everything I do. He starts his ministry at the age of 33 by saying, I am baptized as an example to those who come after me. But it says in that moment, the Spirit descends upon him, and there is this empowerment for Jesus. Everything he does, go and read the Gospels, you never see Jesus and his work without the Spirit empowering him. Okay, lastly then, so how does the Holy Spirit give us this power? Let me read to you Acts 1 verse 4 to 8. Jesus says he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem before he's about to leave them with his great commission. He says, but wait for the promise of my Father. It's a promise, which he said, you have heard from me. John baptized with water, yes, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just think about that picture, submerged in water. Here we have, uh, soon to be full again, a little baptismal pool. It's been such a blessing these first three and a half years of Hatfield to see people submerged fully in the water of baptism, saying, yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Imagine the same word, to be fully submerged in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Man, what you need as a parent is to be fully submerged in the power of the Holy Spirit. For you to run your business with skill, with excellence, with the character of God, you need to be fully submerged in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he says, yes, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And verse 8 says, and when you receive, there's that posture again, not when you make it happen, not when you shout loud enough, Not when the music is so nice in the background that then the Holy Spirit works. No, he says, when you receive and when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses. Those who follow Jesus become witnesses when they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So question, aren't we just all baptized by the Spirit at salvation? (laughs) Why do we do all this extra stuff? My uncle, who's a Christian, tells me that's nonsense. That's charismania. We all have the Spirit. Why do you need anything else? And I want to say that, yes, some people would argue that we we receive the baptism, the salvation, fully. all of it happens in once. But I want to say, as, as Dr. Dale, our belief is that these are three separate moments of faith, all by God's power and initiative, not something we can do. But here you see the disciples, those who already followed Jesus in John 13 and 15, Jesus says, you are already clean. And yet to them, he says, Acts 1 verse 8, wait until you are filled, baptized by the Holy Spirit. That to me seems like two separate things. Paul, who is saved in Acts 9, he calls Jesus Lord. So he is following, believing in Jesus. Yet when Jesus sends another disciple to go and pray for Paul, he says, and laying his hands on Paul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That to me sounds like a separate moment. Or the Samaritans, beautiful moment. It says, verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, received the word of God. It says they sent Peter and John to them, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them. Can't get it more clearly than that. But they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> That's as clear as it gets. I don't want to pick a fight. I'm just saying this is what we believe as Dr. Dale. I profess my faith in Jesus alone through grace. I'm saved. I'm made new. I make a profession, public profession of faith through being baptized. We call it the baptism of the believer. That's why we don't baptize infants. It's a profession of my faith. And then I say, Jesus, I'm trusting that you would come and baptize me in your spirit. 
Give me your gifts. Give me your boldness. Give me your power. Give me your anointing. With the Spirit comes everything that is needed for the life in the Spirit. So I want to say, last maybe question is, um, do I have to then, I see in this passage, some really out there things, like people started speaking in tongues and prophesying. Is that like the sign? Unless you speak in tongues, you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I think for me, the honest answer is no. Again, I do know there are brothers and sisters of our faith that would disagree with me, some Pentecostal brothers. Uh, They would preach much more sweatily and loudly than I would in any way, but they would say, friends, no, you need to speak in tongues. Otherwise, you haven't received the Spirit. But what I see is all throughout the book of Acts, for instance, uh, you know, you do see tongues characterizing that moment at Pentecost, Acts 2. You do see Cornelius, he's baptized with the Spirit, he speaks in tongues. You do see the, the people at Ephesus here that we just spoke about, Acts 19, but... You don't see anything about speaking in tongues or any other gifts, actually, when the people of Samaria and Acts 8 are baptized in the Spirit, or when Paul receives the Spirit, and on and on it goes. You see in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, moments where people are baptized with the Spirit, and God chooses to give them certain gifts, and other times where it doesn't happen. It is not a stamp of approval that you have received the baptism of the Spirit. You will know that the plane has landed, but what that looks like can be very different for many different people. I know good friends who said, man, I, had, I was a Christian, and for months, maybe even years, I, I know that I'd never been baptized in the Spirit yet, but that moment, people laid hands on me, they prayed, and I just had the clearest call over my life in that moment. Or I had the deepest experience of the love of the Father covering my brokenness. Or I suddenly just realized I had received in faith a gift that is, that is well beyond anything I understood before. I suddenly had this unction to pray for people to be healed. There are so many things that can happen, but the plane will land and you will know it. Paul will ask you, have you been baptized in the Spirit? And you will say, yes. So I want to end. Just like Darren Harrison and Robert Morgan, I want to say that we want to live lives as missional professionals. When we say, Holy Spirit, will you just come alongside me? I do not know how to do this. I do not know how to do this. But I, like these men and women in the book of Acts, I'm open and I'm willing to receive. I'm open and I'm willing to receive. I think of this, and I end with it, Henry Blackaby, he says in his book, Experiencing the Spirit, he says, if we function according to our ability alone, we will get the glory. But if we function according to the power of the Spirit within us, God will get the glory. God's call for you is, yes, I love you. I call you to become my son and my daughter. In my power, I raise you to life. Identify with my son publicly. That you are not just, not just a, a professing Christian, but a, a, a disciple, a follower of Jesus. But know this, that I want to work so powerfully within you. That even in the moments where you say, God, as a plumber, poet, pediatrician, programmer, father, son, colleague, neighbor, as a Christian, I do not know how to do this. I will do it in you, and I will do it through you, and I will get the glory. This is the calling of Christianity.